So God's grace and his peace are yours in Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a sermon outline for you if you'd like to check that out. It'll also, of course, be displayed for you if you're watching the screen, if you're online, as we continue in the being challenge, and we get to the section that says study scripture. In fact, in this, I'm going to pull many of the main points from this being challenge, and so a lot of those big pages and all those little things that you see in here, if you haven't been in this yet, are uh, directly lifted from that in today's message. And so I want to emphasize a couple of things for you, and that's just just thinking about the noise we are hearing right now, uh, whether it's in the media or in books or in movies or in music and in places like that. And I want to ask if you have heard these phrases before. It's kind of rhetorical. I'm sure all of you have had. But let's just see how we do. How many of you heard the phrase fake news? <laughs> the laughter says everything. Disinformation or misinformation. It's another one we're hearing right now. Fact checking. Half truth. Alternative facts, propaganda. Sound familiar, anybody? What I tell my students sometimes, especially when they get into upper levels, especially in uh, classes like government, is that it's not so much what you're hearing, but what you're not hearing is often the issue. So it's not a direct lie. It's a lie of omission rather than a lie of commission. So you're told some of the truth, just not all of the truth. And so it's pretty hard to know what is true. You have to read broadly and check sources from all different parts of the political spectrum. It's work. And so often it's easy to just give up and say, oh, I really can't know anything. It's just a mess. And I've been there and I teach this stuff. <laughs> I'm like, I, this, is, this, is, this is, you know, I'm getting tired of this. I'm reading this source and this source and this source and I see these, you know, five talking heads. I still don't know what truth and error actually is. We need a starting point, a better starting point, a source that never fails and a source that can be our glasses by which we view, uh, view the world correctly and determine right from wrong, truth from error. And which takes me to my first point here, which is that the Bible is truth. And I really like that analogy, that a biblical worldview is like that set of glasses that you put on. And Christ says this. He says that truth is defined by God's word. And Christ himself says, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's in John 14, 6. It's a great memory verse. I know my, my kids have memorized that verse. And so when you put on a pair of glasses and you have bad eyes, I'm nearsighted and really, really badly nearsighted. I play music and I read a lot, so anything beyond where Pastor Dinger's sitting starts to get fuzzy. So I wear really, really thick contacts. And so when I put those contacts in or I put my glasses on, I can see the world for what it really is. I can get to 2020, and with my glasses, it's 2015. They've almost overcorrected me, okay? I can see the world really, really clearly. I can see it as it is. Now, if I get bad glasses or the wrong prescription or colored glasses, the world doesn't look correct. I can get red colored glasses and it looks red. I can get a bad prescription, everything looks fuzzy or blurry. My, my, my case for you today here is that since the Bible is truth, when you look at the world through the lens of scripture, you see things the way they really are. Because God's word is truth. I also find it interesting that Jesus says th th this phrase here in John 17, that we would be sanctified, made holy, set apart for a purpose, consecrated, made clean by him and through his word. It's through God's word this happens. Notice also that it's God that's doing the work. Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, thy word is truth, sanctify them by your truth. God's doing the sanctifying. We're not sanctifying ourselves in this case. By encountering the truth of God's word, when the Holy Spirit creates faith in us and sustains us, the word of God calls us to a new purpose. It works on us because it's true. And this is not a conditional truth. So in other words, it doesn't matter where you're born or what your socioeconomic background is or if you're a man or a woman or if you're old or young or what state your body is in. It's true for everybody everywhere. And we teach this as the word of God because it reflects God's character. And what do we know about God, right? God is perfect. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is love. He is justice. He is all those things in his person. He doesn't change. He can't deny himself. So wouldn't it make sense if his word reflected some of those properties? And the fancy word we've come up with on this is that God's word is infallible, which is a way of saying that it's incapable of being wrong, which means when God's word talks about something, it's true. When it touches a subject like history, it's true. Think about how much of a blessing this is, especially if you're in a circumstance like our brothers and sisters in Ukraine right now. When your whole world has come apart, when you have something that will never fall apart, 
the promises that you hear in the word, the promises of Christ. No invasion can take away their baptisms. No, no, no world event can put Jesus back in the grave. Those things are always true. So imagine how blessed those promises are, those truths in God's word for the people in Ukraine right now, and also even in Russia also. How much of a blessing is the eternal word of God when your world comes apart? How precious are the true promises when you have no idea of what tomorrow brings or whether or not there will even be a tomorrow? Since God's word is truth, when everything else seems to be passing away, God's word never passes away. And of course, we cannot forget that God's word always points us to our Savior, who is the summit and meaning behind all of Scripture and its ultimate fulfillment. As we go to this next point here, and this is related to this, because the Bible is true, because God's word is true in everything that it touches, it should be reliable in all areas. And I want to give you a couple of areas that might surprise you from history that show you the reliability of God's word. We could talk about how accurately it's been preserved and transmitted. We could, of course, and, and Pastor Zender in the Red Letter Challenge has a thing called Not a Blind Faith. It's a little uh, unit that's coming up. I think it's uh, on Wednesday. It's Not a Blind Faith. And he points to the resurrection, and that's awesome. That is the summit of our faith. That is foundational, the resurrection of Jesus. But here's a couple of things you might not know. So every year, the U.S. Census Bureau releases data on names. What are the most popular baby names? Right? And so, a few years ago, I know for girls, it was Olivia, for example, was a very popular girl's name. I know boy names that sound like, last, uh, that sound like city names, like Jackson, are really popular. Or anything with S-O-N, right? S-O-N, Jackson and Tayson and those sort of names. Very popular the last 10 years or so in America. And the reason we know, and that's how you can tell when somebody's born often, is the generation of names. In my, my generation, my wife's generation, the name Jennifer is really popular. There are a lot of Jennifers uh, over the age of 30. How many Jennifers do you know that are teenagers? Very few, right? Very few. The names have changed. And so you can tell when that happens. Um, also, think back in the 1920s, names like Pearl or Francis or Opal or Ruby, names that we don't use very much anymore. And so the same was true in the ancient Near East and in the ancient world. The names change. So one of the ways to see if something is accurate historically is to see if those names by percentage are roughly close to what was going on in the culture at that time. There's a book out there by Richard Bauckham. He's a, he's a historian in England called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And you want to talk about doing some historical work. He went and looked at all the gravestones from the time period of Jesus in Israel and got all their names. He looked at tax records. He looked at deeds and titles and other literature of the time and found the most common names and said the most common eight names of this time that are found in the Bible are used about 38.6% of the time. So he looked at scripture and said, let's see how close this is. And it's within a percentage point. That would only work if you were an eyewitness. They didn't have access to census data. They didn't have access to the top, top 10 baby names of 4 BC. They didn't have that. And yet here we look at the New Testament and the names, the percentage of names being used exactly correlate in history to the names that would be used. You'd almost think they were eyewitness testimony or something. And that's why I put this passage up here for you in 2 Peter. Look what it says. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power, of coming, power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. You do not have a blind faith. It is a faith, but it isn't based on something that you wish to be true or you hope is true. It's based in real history. Another example that I have for this, again, these are just examples that are not often used, but they just confirm the scripture's account. What if I asked you, 80 years ago, what was the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the Mexican peso? And you don't have the, you don't have the internet, you don't have the library, you don't have all these, you know, U.S. tax records, or, you have nothing like that, okay? You're just a first century educated rabbi. Let's just say that. What's the exchange rate from 80 years ago? How well would you do with pesos to dollars? I had to guess that none of us would get it right, right? In the New Testament, they go through all this stuff without any effort at all and get all these exchange rates correct. The famous story, for, uh, famous example of this is when they're supposed to pay the, supposed to pay, forgive me, the temple tax, which was one half shekel per adult. So Jesus tells Peter, Go and go fishing and find this coin which will exactly pay the amount for me and you. And that's one shekel. So Peter goes, he fishes, gets the coin out of the fish's mouth, out of the fish's gut, 
Amazing. It's an amazing miracle. What's even more amazing is that in the Greek, they get the exchange rate right because they've mentioned the Greek form for this tax, which is that one shekel equals four drachma. They get it right. Okay, you would not be able to get that right if you're writing this as a later legend. This is based on eyewitness testimony when you're putting this stuff down. And we could go through dozens and dozens. There's so much of this. There's a 17-volume work done in the 1700s, 17 volumes, that talks about the historical accuracy of the Gospels. So if you love that, dive right in. There's, you will spend a lifetime studying through that. I would spend a lifetime studying through this. And so it is not a coincidence. This is eyewitness testimony. The Bible is reliable. There's not been a single thing that's been dug out out of the dirt that has contradicted the truths of Scripture. Dr. Paul Meyer, who used to be a vice president in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, was a professor at Western Michigan University, and he brings up the fact that every time we discover something from this era and time period, 85% of the time, it instantly confirms the biblical account. Instantly. Name any other faith that's like that. Honestly. And then for that other 10 to 15%, you can quibble and argue about it. It's usually things about dates or place names and stuff like that. But almost instantly, 85%, everything in archaeology immediately confirms the biblical account. There is nothing like this. You're not taking a back seat. When it comes to the evidence of God's word, we as Christians, it's exciting. There is exciting things out there. But there's another form of reliability in Scripture that I think is even more important than this. If you want more on this, by the way, come talk to me. I love talking about this. Pastor Dinger's got stuff. But it's not the main point of this. There's something else in terms of its reliability. The scriptures are also reliable in the sense that they confirm what the Holy Spirit does by creating faith in us. And this is done through the preaching and hearing of the word of God. As much as I would like all of you to have an apologetic, a Christian apologetic, isn't it interesting that because of God's word, people who have no clue about its historical accuracy or those who only have access to a Bible or maybe some instruction, maybe Pastor Dinger's Life of Christ class or Life in Christ, they can actually know more and baffle thousands of people with PhDs? How is that possible unless it's something that comes from God because God's word is eternal and he makes foolish the ways of the world? Obviously, God is at work through his word, providing wisdom and understanding through the eyes of faith because only through faith in Christ, with these biblical glasses, through faith, can we have proper understanding? The Bible is reliable both in history and in everything it touches, but also because it accomplishes what God wants it to accomplish, which is to show us his grace through faith in his son. But it doesn't end there either. Because God's worth is not only truthful and reliable, the Bible also transforms, which is your third, uh, your third point. Pastor Zender in this book uh, quotes another pastor, and this I love this quote because it talks about the power of God's word. It says, God's word generates life. It creates faith. It produces change. It frightens the devil. It causes miracles. It heals hurts. It builds character. It defeats temptation. It infuses hope. It releases power. It cleanses our minds. It brings things into being and guarantees our future. That's quite a list. And I need a little of that. And I think you would agree that in the world in which we live, we need a little of that. We need some healing. We need character building. We need temptation to be defeated. And that's not even a complete list. Pastor Zender, in his own words, says it this way. He says, the reason his word changes me and transforms me is because it's good news. The more I dig into God's word, the more I discover his great love for me. It's ultimately God's kindness that gives me the desire and the power to change. So I'm going to give you a couple of stories of what I mean by that. And the way he says this is because God transforms us, he then allows us to transform the world. He works through us. And that's a pretty amazing thing. By transforming us, the world around us is also transformed. And so in my obligatory Lord of the Rings reference as a Grace member here, okay, I want to bring up the Hobbit movies, which are not kind of all canon. This isn't necessarily a Tolkien quote. This is a Tolkienese type quote or Tolkien-esque quote. But it's from the movies, and it's in the, 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 the mouth of Gandalf, who's kind of an angel. He really is. He's an angel incarnate in Tolkien's universe. And it's talking about how we confront evil or how we deal with the evil in our world. And he says, unlike this other wizard named Saruman, who's all about power, there's actually, think about how the world is actually transformed. This is how he says it. He says, Saruman believes it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But that is not what I have found. I found it is in the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. 
It's just being family. It's doing the things that God has tasked, with, tasked us with. It's being transformed by his word, one believer, one person at a time. Being transformed by God's world, world, sorry, word, we help to change the world one small act at a time. I have another story for you that's related to this, and this is from a church that I was in in Chicago. It was an independent church. And our, the pastor there was really good about practical Christian living. Now, I happen to think our theology is better, which is why I'm here and not in a church like that. But they're really good at just that practical living. And he had a man who struggled being alone. He was a, he was, he was a single guy. Um, his wife had been gone for a long stretches of time as well. And then his wife passed away, I, I believe is the story. And so he was always alone and was always facing temptations while being alone. And so the pastor said to him, hey, hey, let's, let's figure out a strategy. Let's find some scripture to memorize. Let's find some Christian music, some songs or some hymns that you can know really, really well, that you can memorize, that whenever you're, you're facing this, this is what's going to come to mind. You'll remember this scripture or you'll remember the song. And, so, and, and I also want to, these first couple weeks when you face this, I want you to call me because I'm your pastor and I want to help you out. Let's walk through this. Let's use our technology. Let's use the phone. Let's figure this out. And so about a week later, the pastor was in a meeting, and he had his computer out and all these other different things, and all of a sudden his phone rings, and it's this guy. He's like, oh, no, it's in the middle. How do I do this? And he said, I'm just going to make up a name. You know, hey, John, hey, hey, can you wait for just a second? Just wait for just a second. I've got to finish this meeting, and we can talk. So he's holding the phone up, and he's finished sends the, sending an email, and he's finishing talking to the person in his office and all that. And he says, and he hears on the voice, he hears some singing in the background. Just hears singing. Very distant, can't make it out. And he's like, uh, hello, are you, are you still there? Do you need me? He's like, oh, sorry, pastor. I'm good now. Thanks. <laughs> and he had sung the song that he had memorized based on this temptation. Amazing. That's the power of God's word, how it transforms us. Even in our daily lives, when we're facing those temptations, God's word has power, as the scripture says. It's living and it's active. Hearing God's words, memorizing God's words, allows us to face those temptations and also allows us to know who we are, which is my next point, and that's the Bible provides true identity. It's often been said that the farmer at his plow in 1800 had more in common with somebody 1,000 years before him than 100 years after him. This is 1800. And in the last 60 years, I think you'd agree with me that the change has increased even more rapidly in our information age. It seems like every generation has a new toy or a new rapid increase in technology. And so the human psyche, I don't think, fully has co comprehended, and our society has not comprehended all the stuff that has happened, even in just the last generation or two. In the high Middle Ages, it was a lot easier to know who you were. If you were a 10-year-old in the Middle Ages, you knew what your job was going to be. You probably had already met your wife by the age of 10. You probably didn't know it, or your husband, if you're a girl. You, you would have known. You would have known what your job was going to be. You knew what your church was. You probably knew the place that you were going to live, the place that you were going to die. You knew who the king was. Your identity was given to you all from the outside. Now, you have to decide that for yourself in 2022. That's pretty hard. And when you add the pandemic that we've been dealing with and isolation from this, when you add wars on top of this, many people, not just young people, but many people, struggle with knowing who we are and what our purpose is. Harvard University in 2021, at the very end of last year, did a study of young people, ages 18 to 29. This is going to back up some of the stuff Pastor Dinger talked about last week in terms of the need that's out there. It's one of the reasons that we uh, cooperated and built our counseling center here at, the, at Grace, because the need is so great in our community, and we're trying to meet that need, which there's been, it's been full. It's been full. They've been busy because the need is here. It's not just out there. It's here in our own community. So 18 to 29 years old, listen to this. How many people in the last two weeks have multiple times experienced the following systems, uh, symptoms? Not just once, not just twice, but multiple times in the last two weeks experienced these symptoms. Here we go. 51% have experienced feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Over half of young people, 51%. With young women, it's even higher at 61%. 35% of young people believe there's going to be a second civil war. Imagine living with that constant anxiety. 52%, so over half again, believe that the country is in trouble or failing. Why do I bring this data up? And the reason is, is because as human beings, we long for a sense of belonging, of purpose, and of value. We want stability, something solid, something that gives us place and purpose in the universe. When we don't have this, we see the anxieties and fear that the other polls report. 
So what do we do about this? Since we, since we need this, what do we do about the state of affairs? In the scriptures, we hear our true identity. We find out who we really are. In this John 17 passage, he says, All of mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in, him, in them. We belong to God. We start here. Our identification is with our Lord and King. And I love the image of baptism here. Because it's when Christ says yes to us. God says yes to us. We are now identified with him. When we make the sign of the cross every morning, as, uh, as Lutherans have been trained to do, and I'm not saying you're a better Lutheran if you do or if you don't, but it's a great practice. Why? Because it reminds us who we are. When I wake up in the morning and I do this, I have now recognizing I am marked by Christ, the one who has died for me. I am his and he is mine. That's how we start. We don't start with our nationality. We don't start with race or we don't start with gender or any of those things. We start by being in Christ. It's powerful. That moment of baptism, when you've seen baptisms here uh, at Grace, when you hear those words, receive the sign of the Holy Cross upon your head and upon your heart to mark you as, as, as redeemed by Christ the crucified. Isn't that awesome? You are now having an identity. You don't have to question what your identity is. You are a child of God. I love that in the blessings, too. When you come forward and kids are blessed, you'll often hear this, words like, in your baptism, you are a child of God. How awesome is that to hear that as a kid in the world where they're told all these different competing things, no, you're God's child because in your baptism, Christ has already said yes to you. And now we say yes to God. It is awesome. It is powerful. This is who we really are. And the more, and this is to, to go to Zender, the more we study scripture and the metaphor he uses, and you saw it in Psalm 119 also, the more we eat scripture, isn't that a weird analogy? You know, people are eating scrolls in the Old and New Testaments, and it's kind of an odd analogy, but it means it's becoming a part of us because we are what we eat. You know, the, the old phrase, when I was a little kid, really little, we heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out. And it had to do with media and those sort of things, but it also has to do with food. You put junk food in your body, your body's probably not going to perform very well. I once heard a, um, one of the, the pastors in town's wives, I was teaching piano, and we were in the high school, and we have a vending machine. Now, it's all zero calorie, but it's still Coke, right? Walking by, oh, mom, I really want a Coke. And she's like, your body's not a trash can. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I won't be buying that anytime soon. You know, it's like... It made me feel bad, but that was her point, and she's in the medical field, and that was, her, that was her point, is that what you put in matters, right? What you eat matters. And so when we consume Scripture, it's sweet like honey, as it says in Psalm 119, and the more we live out our baptisms, in which Christ has said, said yes to us, we realize our true identity. This is our true identity, to be in Christ. And now as we go to the last point, I want to tell you a quick story. Um, a lot of you remember that in 2015 to 2016, I was an emergency member at Faith Lutheran Church. And an uh, emer emergency uh, minister in a sense. And so I went over there and I was preaching and I was also doing visitation with the elders over there. And there was an elderly woman who was in her 90s. And she was barely functional as far as I could tell. She was mostly blind. She could only hear out of one ear. She often didn't interact with you, but we would still bring her communion. She was a lifelong member of the church, and I had not ever done this before. This was my way. I mean, it was kind of baptism by fire, so to speak. Just, just do it. So I went and did it with the elders, and we went through the service. So we had a reading from the scriptures, and we did the creed and the Lord's Prayer. And this woman in her 90s, who hadn't even responded to us being in the room, all of a sudden started speaking the Lord's Prayer extremely powerful. I did not expect it. I had no clue what I was doing, right? I'm just in here, just, I'm just following the hymnal. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be the, the, the faithful servant, so to speak. And all of a sudden, here's a woman who, because of her identity in Christ, hears the voice of her Savior. And that's your final point. She hears that voice and speaks it. Christ taught her that prayer. And so here she is in her last days. She's lost almost everything. And she's still speaking the voice of her Savior. That's how powerful this really is. Jesus in John 16, 33, right before, when he's talking to his disciples, right before his priestly prayer, says the following. He says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Notice that Jesus doesn't say you might have trouble. He doesn't say you maybe will have something bad happen to you. He says you will have trouble. You will have trials. You will have tribulation. But that he has overcome the world. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be disease and pandemics. There will be loss and brokenness. 
There will be crime and inflation. Yet, his command for us here is to be what? Of good cheer. Or in other translations, to take heart. Now, this doesn't mean that we never cry. It doesn't mean that we never mourn. It doesn't mean that we never have a bad day. It does mean, however, that through all that, we can have joy. The world needs joy right now. The world needs peace that passes all understanding. It needs it. And God has, for whatever in his mysterious counsel, chosen his people, who are also broken, to be his ambassadors, giving and showing that joy and peace. Imagine what our community would look like if we had the reputation of being, those people up at Grace Lutheran, look how joyful they are. Look how peaceful they are. Look how they just love being in community together. How infectious and how attractive do you think that would be right now in our current environment? And that's, it's kind of a law point, but it's more of a gospel point because God has done that for us already. Think about the joy we have knowing who we really are. Think of how liberating and how relieving that would be for our neighbors in this community to know who they really are, who are people that are dearly loved by Christ and redeemed and loved by him. Think how awesome that really is and how that would transform the world around us if we as Christians would be, to use the word in Zach, uh, Zach Zender's book here, be in Christ. When we are in the scriptures, when we feed on them, when we memorize them, when we contemplate them, when we pray over them, when we speak them, when we sing them, we can experience that steady joy and peace that passes all understanding. So when we hear the voice of our king, we know that sin, death, and the devil has been defeated. When we hear the voice of the Lamb of God, we know that we have been forgiven. When we hear the voice of the creator of the universe, we know that we are more than conquerors and will eternally be reigning with him. So let's study scripture as a community. Let's eat scripture so that we can be in him. To God alone the glory. Amen.